Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter, and coming up, we're talking about how the first stars were super weird and also super awesome. And of course, taking listener questions about all things in the universe, because that's what this show is about. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern, so you can leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com, and we'll play that voicemail, and you will ask a question, and I will answer it. And in today's Blue Shift, I'll be talking about telling stories but first the news hello space fans welcome to space radio i'm paul sutter astrophysicist at ohio state and for the next half hour your agent to the stars got a wonderful show for you today on space radio where we talk about all the beauty that is our universe this show lives on listener questions we record every thursday at 4 p.m eastern so so leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com and i will get your questions on the air and i will answer them on the air and we will live in peace and harmony you can also follow along on our live streams on youtube and twitch with the space cadets tuning in live from around the world including but not limited to edinburgh clearwater florida northampton massachusetts fort lauderdale florida kempner texas norway warsaw poland the uk Maribor, Slovenia, Clearwater, Florida, Falloon, Sweden, and Seattle, and DeKalb, Illinois. Let's never forget Illinois. We'll take questions that you send over there on those live streams too. And you go to spaceradioshow.com for the link. Seriously, folks, I've only prepped two and a half minutes of show material, maybe not even that. So get those questions in. Hey, space cadets. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I know, I know. What I'm doing, I'm, I'm not hitting the microphone. I'm hitting the table. Ready? Because I get really excited by talking about science. And, oh, how oh, Serbia. Sorry, I missed you, Serbia. No, I'm not in studio today. I'm actually in Tucson, Arizona on my book tour. So no Greg. Sorry, folks. Sorry, fans of Greg. And sorry to Greg, too. He couldn't come with me because... I didn't want him to. I wanted just to go solo on this trip. Like, can't I have a life without you, Greg? See, Greg's going to get the recording of all this, so he gets to hear all this. Yeah, get your questions in, and then Nancy will copy them over. And so get some questions while I talk about some cool news. I got to have a better system for doing this remotely. I'll figure it out someday. Before I start taking questions, I wanted to share some interesting bits of news I caught recently. And hey, stars have been around in our universe for a while. And there was a time when there were no stars. We called the Dark Ages. Super cool name. And then one day the stars appeared. The universe lit up with the first stars. We call this the Cosmic Dawn. Also a very cool name. But these stars in the early universe, all we had in the early universe was hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium, but nobody cares about lithium. So we can just talk about hydrogen and helium. So the stars that formed were very, very different than the kinds of stars around today, because the kinds of stars around today have been through a few generations. And as stars live and die, they form heavy elements and those heavy elements end up in the later generations of stars. So these first stars we think were massive, like at least a hundred times bigger than the sun fused hydrogen through a very complex process, exploded in massive supernova explosions, and seeded the universe with those first batches of heavy elements, things like iron and zinc and nickel. And these ended up contaminating the next generations of stars, and then those stars would live and die, and then they would contaminate the next generation. So as time goes on, the universe gets a little bit more heavy metal, right? Our own sun is called what's called a population one star. And the first stars to appear in the universe are confusingly called a population three star. Don't even get me started on astronomical nomenclature. It just makes no sense, so don't even bother. Now, the middle stars between the first stars and stars like our sun are called population two stars. And we have none of the population three stars left in our universe. Like those original stars... We got nothing. We got nothing. There's just no, none of those stars remaining because they lived so quickly. 
but the population two stars are still hanging around. They're not, there's not a lot of them, you know, they hang out in some retirement communities, you know, maybe near Clearwater, Florida. I don't know where these population two stars are, but we can't, we can't study the first generations of stars because, you know, there aren't around anymore, but we can study the next generation. And by looking at the kinds of elements in that next generation, we can take guesses as to what the first generation looked. It's like looking at looking at your parents to try to guess what your grandparents looked like. And there's a peculiar star in the Milky Way galaxy. It's about 5,000 light years away. And it has goes by the wonderful name of HE 1327-2326. One, one of my favorite names. I might name my kids that someday or not. Now, this star has a lot of, doesn't have a lot of iron, but it does have a lot of zinc, which is weird. And astronomers ran a bunch of simulations to figure out like, how do you make a lot of zinc? And one of the only ways to make a lot of zinc and get it to spew all over the Milky Way is if a star blows up, not spherically like a ball, but comes out in two massive jets. And so the astronomers think that maybe the first stars typically died these in these fantastic supernova ways, not as like spherical balls of explosions, but long jets that would blast through millions of light years. And that's awesome. But it's just a guess. It's just a guess. Maybe your grandparents exploded in a similar way. I don't know. That's the latest and greatest when it comes to space, but it's time to answer some questions. All right, I'm sorry about the lag, folks. I'm staying at an Airbnb in Tucson, and the, the Wi-Fi is not the greatest. I, I have noticed before, because this happened before when I do some Weather Channel gigs, when I move my arms around a lot like this, it tends to drop because the there's a lot more information to process. Uh, but when I, so when, I, but when I keep my hands down like this and I try to keep myself contained, it, it does a better job. All right, let's see if you guys... Uh, I'm pulling up some questions on the Slack. Thank you, Nancy. We do have some voicemails. On air questions. Why can I not see the latest questions? That's weird. Nancy, are you posting to the to the Slack? That is so weird. The last I have from you is in October, which I know is wrong. So, but I can pull it up on my phone. Sorry, folks. Oh, that's right. It's Discord. We switched to Discord. That, that makes a lot more sense. That's why there's no questions on the Slack, because we don't have a Slack anymore. We did it on Discord. Yeah, I need to, pure ostension, I need to contain myself. There we are. Questions. There we are. Man, we got a lot of questions. Okay, so I'll do one voicemail, and then we'll do a bunch of questions from the Space Cadets. Because you guys are here, and you, you're live. You are dedicated, and I love you. Sorry, Greg. We've got a voicemail question off the bat, so go ahead and, Greg, play the tape. Hi, Paul. My name's Jason, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. And I have two questions for you. The first one is, are you more for the SLS rocket versus the Falcon Heavy or the privatized sector? And then my second question is, are you for a moon return trip or for a Mars trip? Me personally, I'm for the SLS and a moon trip, but just curious to see what you say. And also, you should bring your book signing to Missouri so I can meet you. All right, thanks a lot. I love your show. Bye. Oh, great set of questions, Jason. And I wish my book tour brought me around Missouri because I'd be awesome to meet you and be awesome to sign your book. But... It just wasn't in the cards for this book. Maybe the next one. All right. But as to your question, uh, you know, what's going on with space? Like, what are some of the big advancements that we're going to see and where are they going to come from? 
So we have the public sector, we have NASA, which is developing something called the Space Launch System or SLS, which is a gigantic rocket. Just like, you know, imagine rockets from years past, only more so. And then we have private industry efforts like SpaceX and Blue Origins that are developing more, a different kind of rocket. See, the Space Launch System or SLS, it is like the old school rockets where you build it, you fill it up, you launch it, and then when it's done, you ditch it in the ocean and then you do the whole thing again. And it's kind of pricey. It's kind of pricey, but I guess like NASA's good at that kind of stuff of making rockets, and so that's what they're gonna do. Now, the Space Launch System has, uh, it's supposed to have tons of lift capacity so that it can get, say, a capsule to the moon or to Mars, which I find absolutely fascinating as a little sidebar here. It's been decades since we've had the ability to go send people to the moon. Like the Saturn V rockets that sent the Apollo missions to the moon, once we stopped making those, we stopped having the ability to send people to the moon. So it's been decades. Like if we decided like, hey, you know what, everyone, tomorrow we should go back to the moon? We can't because we don't have big enough rockets. The space launch system will be big enough if they ever actually <clears throat> finish building it. Now on the private sector side, we have some very interesting advancements. SpaceX is slowly, slowly, slowly building bigger and bigger rockets. And right now they have something called the Falcon Heavy, uh, which is the biggest rocket they have right now. Not big enough to send a capsule to the moon or Mars, but the, but the next one should be. And one of the most amazing things about the private industry efforts is that the rockets are reusable. You see, the, the fuel that goes into rocket is, is cheap. All right, it's just like propane. It's not propane, but it's like propane. It's not expensive. What's expensive is are the engines. The engines are some of the most complicated devices ever devised by human beings. And it, they're kind of expensive. And so to ditch the rocket and the engine every time you use it, man, that's just, that's brutal. So instead, what SpaceX and Blue Origins are trying to do is, is reuse them. Like launch it, send something up in space, and then bring the rocket back and polish it up, refill it, and give it another go. This is obviously very, very challenging, but the SpaceX and Blue Origins have made tons of great advances in getting this to work. Now, as so, so actually, when it comes to feasibility for future spaceflight, I'm actually leaning more towards the private sector. Yeah, and I know Jason, you're about the on the all about the SLS. I hope this doesn't spoil our friendship. But I'm really more about the private sector here. I think they're making more advances and they're making more advances on a regular basis than NASA is. And they actually think they have a better ability to maintain a long-term vision. One of the challenges with NASA is that they get a new boss every four years and their budget can change potentially every single year. So as soon as they cook up a plan, the new boss comes in and says, no, we don't want to do that anymore. Or new Congress comes in and says, you know what? We don't want to spend our money on that anymore. And so it's very, very hard to maintain long-term vision in that kind of environment. Now, as to the moon versus Mars, I think we're going to end up going back to the moon first. When it comes to moon versus Mars, I mean, there's so many pluses and minuses to each. The moon is boring, but it's close, which is nice, but has really low gravity. Mars is way further away, but it does have higher gravity and it's cooler. Like it's more awesome to go to Mars. Say you've been to Mars than the moon. The moon is so passe nowadays, but it might make a good training ground. So I, I, on that debate, I really don't have a strong opinion because I can definitely see it going both ways and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, thank you for that awesome question, Jason. We're going to take a quick break. Don't forget, you can leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com and I will answer that question on the show. Maybe not to your satisfaction, but I'll give it a shot. I'm Paul Sutter and this is Space Radio. This show is brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can keep this show on the air. It really is. It's your dollars that are doing it, folks. So get over there, patreon.com slash pmsutter, and I'll see you after the break. That was a really good question, Jason. I liked it. I liked it. Thank you. But I know the space cadets are champing at the bit. 
Wow, so many questions. Not in studio today. That is technically a question. So uh, Optimus Narkel. So no, I'm not in the studio today. Did all galaxies start out as quasars? Ooh, gravity on Kepler 452b. What is the gravity on Kepler 452b? I gotta look this up. Surface gravity Kepler 452b. What's it gonna be? Oh, it's about twice that of Earth. Okay. Ooh, that is a fun question. I'll definitely answer that one from David. Gorin, we'll talk about galaxies and quasars. Uh, how, oh, Peppers, how do you go up and rank from space kid? You, space, you stay as a space kid at forever. There's no other option. Oh, and Princess, uh, what is the relationship between the first stars and black holes at the center of the galaxy? And nine chimera. Okay, we got some great questions, Philip, the next nine minutes. We'll start with David. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We've got tons of Space Cadet questions lined up, ready to go, more than I could possibly answer in a single show, which is why you should catch the live streams, because I usually hang out and chat a little bit and answer some more questions that don't end up in the broadcast. Go to spaceradioshow.com for all those links. So let's get started. We've got David Aldrich over on YouTube asking, is the gravity on Kepler 452b too strong? For humans to live there. So Kepler 452b is a planet outside our solar system. It's a lot like Earth except bigger and has gravity about twice as strong that as the Earth. And so that's a good question. Like if we were to visit Kepler 452b, would we enjoy it there? And if we did enjoy, could we live there? Could we have babies? Could we, you know, eat? Could we make cheese, which is a very important industrial process that might rely on the Earth's gravity being exactly a specific value. Uh, I've not seen a lot of research on this subject, so maybe I should investigate that. Twice that of gravity. So obviously humans can survive twice that of gravity. That's two Gs. Uh, you experienced, you've probably experienced two Gs in your life. You can, we have fighter pilots and stuff that are pulling two Gs all the time. But strong gravity does provide a lot of challenges, especially when that strong gravity is pulling down and you're not like strapped into a seat in a comfy chair and you're just trying to walk around and live your life. If I had to guess, and I really am just guessing here, it's probably survivable. There's probably going to be some long-term health effects, just like low gravity has long-term health effects. There's probably going to be long-term strong gravity, health effects, what those might be, who knows? All I know is I don't want to find out. Go, moving on to Goran Thorin over on YouTube, did all galaxies start out as quasars? So quasars are a very particular kind of galaxy where the central black hole in the galaxy is actively feeding on material. And as it feeds, it spews out these massive jets and they're super bright and they're really awesome. We can see them from across the universe. And it's a good thing that most of the quasars or all the quasars are really, really far away. In fact, quasars appear to be a relic of the early universe. There were a lot of quasars back in the day and there's hardly any quasars around today. Well, what we think, well, we're not exactly sure what triggers a quasar. What we think might trigger one is a merger event. When two galaxies collide, you end up s s just dumping a lot of material down into the centers of that newly merged galaxy, and they fall onto the black hole, and they spin around, and then they develop a quasar-like activity. This is why we don't see, this is why we think we don't see a lot of quasars in the present day universe, but just because the universe is bigger and galaxies don't collide as often as they used to. So it's not necessarily that all galaxies start out as quasars. It's just that when galaxies form, they form from the collisions of lots of other things, and that collisions will, will trigger the formation of a temporary quasar. So was the Milky Way a quasar in its past? Probably. Were most galaxies 
had a phase, like a, an adolescent phase called Quasar? Yes, most likely. All right, moving on, we have Princess TS. O1SO on YouTube asking, what is the relationship between the first stars and black holes at the center of the galaxy? That is a good question. We honestly don't know. This era that I mentioned earlier about the dark ages and the cosmic dawn, we actually have no direct observations of this epoch. We don't know what the universe looked like back then. We don't know about the population of the first stars. We don't know about what the first galaxies looked like. They're just, it's a big mystery. And, and we're, we're developing a lot of astronomical programs to try to explore this part of the universe. But for now, it's a lot of guesswork. But what we do see is after this epoch, which was when our universe was a few hundred million years old, when we look back at, galaxies that formed, you know, when the universe was around a billion years old, we see quasars, we see massive black holes, we see a lot of metals, like the, the what we see is a universe that grew up fast. So it looks like, boom, as soon as stars started forming, whoosh, the whole thing happened, and we get galaxies and black holes and metal enrichments, and, it, and the universe doesn't look much different than it is today. What exactly is the time frame? Do black holes form first and then galaxies kind of nestle around them? Do the galaxies form and then they grow a black hole in their center? Do the first stars form and die? And do those provide the seeds for the black holes? Do the black holes come directly for something like dark matter? We honestly don't know. There's a bunch of possible options out there and we just have very, very few observations to back it up. Moving on, Nine Chimera over on YouTube. Do black holes capture dark matter and dark energy? If not, what happens? So dark energy is something we don't understand. But dark energy does appear to be a part of the vacuum of empty space. So where you have, wherever you have an empty box, you've got some dark energy inside of it. Now, when it comes to dark matter... For sure, black holes do capture dark matter. Our best understanding of dark matter is that it's a, an invisible particle. It's a particle that just in, doesn't interact with light, but it does interact with gravity, which means it can be captured by a black hole. If a dark matter particle falls into a black hole, it is gone forever. And that's the end of the story. Moving on, Thunderduck on YouTube asking if Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune combined, would they form Voltron? No, not Voltron, a star. So it depends on what you mean by star. If you want to trigger nuclear fusion, which is a pretty handy definition of a star, you need something like 20 Jupiters combined together. That's like the minimum size you need to form a star. And since Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are all smaller than Jupiter, combine them together, you're not going to get a star. But there is something called a brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is on this fuzzy boundary between really, really big planet and really, really small star. We don't know exactly the lower limit of what a brown dwarf could be, but it's probably somewhere around 5 to 10 Jupiter masses before you can even trigger the formation of a brown dwarf. So even then, if you were to take Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune and mush them all together, you would just end up with a big planet. Sorry, that's the best you're going to get. Moving on... Plain Safety Podcast over on YouTube is asking, as a black hole loses mass due to Hawking radiation, will it reach a point where it's no longer massive enough to be a black hole and change it back into a star or something else that we can see? So as far as we can tell, and again, this is all theoretical because we've never directly observed Hawking radiation, black holes do evaporate and they just become smaller and smaller black holes. And then they just disappear in a big flash of light. That's the best we got. But, you know, we're still working on it. Last question, Eistra7 on YouTube. What is the distance from the center of the Milky Way to the Earth? I don't remember the exact number. I believe it's somewhere around 25,000 light years. We're about two-thirds of the way out from Galactic Center. We're in the suburbs. It's nice and quiet here. we got great schools, low crime rate, 
great place to live, great place to raise a family. Wouldn't want it anywhere else. Thank you all, Space Cadets, for those amazing questions. We're almost out of time today on Space Radio. But before we go, it's time for the Blue Shift. Tons of great questions. Plane safety, so all the questions get to me. Nancy is very, very good at them. I just don't have enough time to answer them. I'm very, very sorry about the stream quality today, guys. I'll do better next time. Next week, I'll be in a different city. I'll be in San Luis Obispo, California. I'm Paul Sutter, and you're listening to Space Radio, and this is The Blue Shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. I recently wrote an article. I did say at the top of the show that I was going to talk about stories, but I changed my mind halfway through the recording. I was recently asked to write an article for Forbes about Elon Musk, the head of SpaceX and Tesla, and how he is set to win. He was announced that he's going to win the Stephen Hawking Medal in Science Communication. And the editor at Forbes asked me, like, you know, just what's your take? Like, does he deserve it? Does he not? I actually thought about it a lot. My first, my my very first, you know, instinct was like, no, he's not a science communicator. Uh, you know, why does he get this science communication medal? But then I thought about it more deeply, because you don't have to be a scientist to be a science communicator. And I thought about the work he does with Tesla and SpaceX and just how prolific he is in the media and social media. And I realized he's, he is communicating science. Like the work he does and his companies do in Tesla and SpaceX uh, features a lot of science, features a lot of research, features a lot of engineering and technology, features a lot of teamwork and collaboration. Like if you want to be a scientist, you can have a career in science in SpaceX and Tesla working on, you know, rocket ships and, and fancy electric cars. So, and since he's so prolific in talking about, you know, the methods and the engineering and the designs and the failures and the successes and what went wrong and what we learned, since he's so prolific in the media and social media about that, I thought, you know what? He's not talking about science but he's like the facts, but the facts aren't the important thing in science. It's the, it's the method of science. It's the approach of science. And he's doing that a lot. He's showing how science works and how science can be practically applied to, to real problems that we're trying to solve. And so, you know what? At the end of the day, I think Elon Musk does deserve the medal with one caveat. I think I deserve the Stephen Hawking science communication medal, but I'll let Elon get it this year and, and then we'll talk to the committee for 2020. Yeah, well, I, I need to get it eventually, but I want to give some other people, make sure they get it, make sure they get their kudos, you know, before it goes to me. You know, it's a, it's a very, very selfless act. And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by the Ohio State University Department of Astronomy. Learn more at astronomy.osu.edu. This show is also brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you can contribute. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, Nancy Graziano for wrangling the space guest, Dan Michalko for being awesome, and all the fine crew at WCBE Radio for making this show possible. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. You can leave a voicemail by going to spaceradioshow.com. Also on the website, you'll find the episode archive and links to the live streams where you too can join the illustrious, illustrious ranks of my darling space cadets. And of course, thanks again, Earthlings, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing and transmission. Great show, folks. Thank you so much. How do we nominate you? You email Stephen Hawking. I don't know. And check this out. Check this out. So when I do the cities, I actually have to write them down because you, you guys throw so many city names at me. So I was digging around this Airbnb for uh, like pencil and paper and I, cause I didn't bring one obviously. And look what I found. Unicorn, your magical notepads. So there you go. You want to know who's magical? If you live in one of these cities, you're magical.
Yeah, and then, yeah, I mean, Thunderduck, this show goes so fast. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Like, I start the show, and I blink, and it's over, and I think some, I answer some questions in the middle of it. But it's just, it's intense. It's an intense show. And, uh, yeah, so I'm in Tucson. I'm on my book tour. I was at... Tucson Science Pub last night. I'll be at Unscrewed Theater tomorrow night. And then I head out to the San Jose Astronomical Association Saturday night. I'll be at Griffith Observatory down in LA Monday. Uh, then over in San Luis Obispo on Thursday, uh, giving colloquium there at Cal Poly, my alma mater. And then Friday, I'm somewhere else. And then I'll be in the Northwest. I'll be in Portland and Seattle area. So if you're in those areas, uh, you know, it'd be great for you to come out. It, I love it, and that's been really cool on this on this journey on this book tour, which is finally starting to wrap up. I'm so tired, but it's fun. It's fun. Um, it's getting to meet you guys. Like people, are, you guys are coming out and saying, "Oh, I listen to your podcast, watch your YouTube videos, saw you on TV." It's just really, really cool that you know you're just not anonymous, you know, pseudo anonymous names on a computer screen. You're actually living breathing beautiful human beings. So I can't wait, uh, and I hope I get to meet some of you on the rest of the store. If not, then uh, the next time.